Morning, Tom. Morning, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting me. Um, and uh, thank you all the companies for the support over the many years that you have given our work at Stanford. Um, we are proud to be part of the construction community and to make the constructive world and with that the world for everybody better. So when Tom and I talk about uh, preparing for this talk, he um, said, what do you want to talk about? And I think for me, um, in 2015, the big deal is automation. It has been for some time, but I think now it is really a big deal. And so I want to talk about that. And you might cringe when you see the title, creating thousands of schedules to find the best one. Then I want to give a bit of a history and outlook of um, automated folding modeling. I saw my first 4D model uh, at Beckles R&D Center in San Francisco in 1987, I believe, when they were building a 4D model for Hitachi Power Plant in Japan. So I have to credit Buddy Cleveland and this group with uh, where I, I saw 4D uh, coming from. Um, there's also Amadeus Burger, um, CSA in Atlanta, that around a similar time was, was working on these kind of technologies. So if somebody else knows more about the history that goes before uh, the mid 80s, uh, then uh, let me know. But uh, one thing that we, uh, you know, being students, and professors, saw very quickly is that uh, as we started to make 4D models, we started in 1993. Um, we did it once, and then we said, "Boy, this is a lot of work." We got to automate. We're basically lazy, right? So we want to have the computer do things. So very soon we got into figuring out how to automate things. And I will give a brief uh, history there and then uh, talk more about a couple of recent projects. But in between, I will share a little bit of theory that we recognized recently that may have been obvious to you all along, uh, but that it is important to motivate why automate the generation of 40 models. And I guess I should share maybe a quick anecdote also with Greg Knudsen and then we, we started to work together with Greg Moulton's and on the concert hall. Um, we had worked with Frank Gehry and his team on, a, on the Experience Music Project before. And so Frank kept telling the Moulton's leadership, call Moulton because they can take your 3D model and help you uh, make it into a construction communication tool. And I think after a few of those calls, Greg thought it's easier to call me and be able to say, yes, I called Martin and we got together. Uh, so I flew to LA and Greg says, first question, so Martin, this 40 model stuff, um, what ROI have you been getting on previous projects? <laughs> and I say, well, Greg, you know, the tool is really about better communication, better decision making, you know, faster cycles, uh, bringing everybody up to the same page. What ROI have you been getting? So we went back and forth on this, and I couldn't give him really an ROI. And but a few weeks later, I said, "Okay, Martin, let's jump in, let's work together." So then uh, that worked out pretty well. So about a year later, he says, "You know, this is really a fantastic tool. We need to spread this in the industry. So why don't you invite?" group of people to come here. And I said, well, even competitors? Yeah, yeah, anybody can come. So we had a group of 20 people show up. They gave them a tour of the site, the, the 40 models. So they got the digital and the, phys and the virtual tour and the physical tour. And then they got together in the conference room. And uh, Greg said, so any questions? You can guess what the first question was from the audience, right? <laughs> Greg, what ROI have you been getting? You've been spending money on this 4D model, what's your return? And then Greg looked at me, smiled, and said, well, let me tell you guys, this is about better communication. <laughs> <laughs> so in a way, I'm glad that we, we haven't, um, actually, the, the ROI topic hasn't come up. I mean, there is ROI, and, and we eventually calculated ROI on the project, but it's actually minuscule. Well, I mean, very good, but minuscule in the context of the whole impact, which is indeed very difficult to quantify. And 
Having grown up in Switzerland with a German father, what was thrilled into me from the very beginning was, Martin, use the best method you can find, otherwise you all stupid. <laughs> this is like, this is, this is the voice from my dad that I have in my head all the time. And so when I saw 4D and I was in construction, I said, well, this makes a lot more sense than as Tom also said at the very beginning and, and, and John and so on, many others, than 2D and GAN charts and things like that. So thank you to our community, um, which is currently are still going quite strong. Uh, since 1988, we have focused on improving the construction industry by bringing better information technology enabled work processes to the, inventing them and bringing them to the industry. And yes, the technology is important, but as Rick said, it's about what you want to achieve for yourself and for the clients and then how your people are going to achieve that. So the center was started because my then professors at Stanford had the vision in the mid 80s that the advent of object-oriented programming out of computer science would bring about something like BIM. That wasn't called BIM then, but it would, that was on the horizon and they felt okay now we can put a whole building or bridge into the computer and analyze it and visualize it in ways you haven't been able to do before. That has the potential to revolutionize how we execute work. And, and that changed the business model, changed the processes, the roles of people, etc. That's what we're seeing actually happening now. And their hunch was that if we worked on this on ourselves in academia, if companies worked on their own by, on it by themselves, we wouldn't be able to see adoption as fast as if we could work together. And that was really the intent of the center. So the first decade or so we focused really on, did focus a lot on the technology. So we would have talked your year off in 1995 about, look how cool this is, this 4D model, and then you can take the 3D and connect it to the estimate, and then you can also connect it to the energy simulation, etc. As long as you were willing to listen, they would have filled your ear with that. As tools started to become on the market, we realized that we need to invent a work method, which we uh, call virtual design and construction. So virtual design and construction is not the same as BIM. It uses BIM, but also the collaboration the performance targets and um, retail process to deliver value to our clients. And uh, as now companies are quite busy bringing virtual design and construction methods, the virtual design and construction method into their practice, we are starting to focus on actually optimizing, but really optimizing in, in the true sense of the word facility performance. So in a nutshell, that's what we've been focusing on. So this is one of the videos that also doesn't work, some codec is missing, one too many transfers of slides. I did want to show one of the early slides, this was in 2002, um, when we had prototyped a parametric 4D modeling tool, which would allow you basically uh, define a start point, a sequence of work in a location, and the direction of work, and the speed of work per work type they would get the quantities from the BIM and figure out how long does it take and then it basically would create your 4D model from that and then you could change the speed, you could change the starting point, the direction, etc. and it would change the model. I mean, there was a tenfold increase in how, in terms of speed of creating a new version of the model. And we tested it on this uh, subway station in the center of Amsterdam where basically the uh, project manager which was Max Bergel from Germany, really didn't know what the driving constraint of this project was going to be. Was it going to be the rate at which the trucks could arrive in this congested area? Was it going to be at which rate at which he excavated? Or at which he could install the temporary bracing in the tunnel? Or which of these major construction processes and the, the corresponding supply chains supply lines were going to pace the job. 
And so we created 40 models with 500 cubic meters per day and 750 cubic meters exhalation per day and so on. Um, small trucks delivering, many truck, uh, big truck deliveries and so on. Um, and without the parametric model, we would have been able, wouldn't have been able to do that. Um, so by working through these 40 models, we actually learned a lot about construction and we realized that uh, not all constraints are created equal. And, and you know that, and there have been many papers about it. But I think um, in terms of a fundamental look at these constraints and their fundamental nature and why we need to treat them differently, um, we haven't seen, I haven't seen that much about that in, in construction literature. There's, of course, the logic of work, right? You have to put formwork and rebound there before concrete and so on. And that's what the CPM method is really good at handling. It's actually perfect, the, the typical precedence constraints. And so those constraints we can handle very well. But then you also have, of course, the labor constraints. And that would be labor, there is other constraints like others like this. But basically, typically, uh, these are resources where you might be able to get more or you might have to do the job with fewer. So there is variable capacity available, or there can be available. And so this, interest, uh, this is important and creates an interesting choice as you apply the creativity, as Tom mentioned at the beginning of the day, to create schedules. And when we create just one schedule, we have to fix some assumptions about the resources we have. And we also know that most likely those assumptions will not actually play out. So we should not, and John Fondal, who is the, my predecessor, Sanford, who brought uh, CPM to the construction industry, um, commented many times, we should not uh, use precedence constraints to sequence work when the reason for that constraint is we assume there's one crew available, and then it goes here, and then it goes there. We do it all the time. At least everybody that I know that makes schedules does it all the time. But we should not do it. Um, we should use the resource leveling algorithms as fully or well they're working um, to handle these constraints. And uh, so these are all and then there is a third constraint, which is the workspace. It's also a resource. But the workspace constraint is different because we cannot make another workspace. There's only one. So it's a unary resource. And that's why it's different from labor. You can get possibly another crew or another crane or something if you really have to. Workspace, you just have that one workspace. And surprisingly, that the most stringent constraint in our projects, and the, the constraint that really makes construction unique, is the least formalized constraint um, in terms of scheduling and planning. And scheduling and planning might predicts the future and, and decides a path of allocating resources which determines whether we're going to win or lose. So I think it is pretty important. So I want to um, share a little bit more, just very briefly explain these constraints a little bit more, and then share two projects that we've done, uh, research projects, uh, that try to overcome uh, these challenges. So this is, I'll go very quick, and I'm just using a very simple example just to make sure that you really understand uh, the issues here. But when you have one crew available and you have four spaces you need to work in, then you can just say we go in one, two, three, four. And often we put a sequence constraint there. Uh, but in fact, we have 24 options, not just one, to sequence those four that work. So yes, if you're a good scheduler, and in a small example, when something changes, you will realize, oh, wait a minute, I can do something different. But you are now left to the devices only of your scheduler. The tool itself is not helping you find a better solution. So that's what happens when we 
fix one of 24 solutions, right? When we have two crews, um, then there is 32 options in which we could employ them. Um, and when we have, say, three crews, there are 36 options in which we could use it. But these things vary all the time. So you can see, even with a small example, it can become quite challenging to keep track of all of the options. In reality, of course, there's thousands, millions of possible configurations that we could actually pursue. And certainly some of them are better or worse than others. Um, so if if we took a, an example here with four zones, uh, 10 activities per zone, and we scheduled it you know, in a half hour way, your duration will always be in this particular case of 148 hours. If you don't half hour it, and then different crews become available, you might have started assuming there's one crew, but all of a sudden the second crew is available, you can actually find dramatically better solutions. Uh, but if you have half hour the sequence constraints, again, the tool does not help you see those solutions. You might see them, or you might not. So we found 40 models to be really very, very effective to help understand that, even though the sequence constraints may, may have been half wired in, as we, uh, the resource constraints may have been half wired in, because you can see um, where work sits idle for a while, where um, the follow-on work isn't coming soon enough. You can see open spaces, etc., where you can possibly schedule more work and speed up the, the project. So this was in 2001, the case we did with DPR on the Bay Street project in Emeryville, where we went very rapidly. Every lunch brought the superintendents and foremen into the trailer, um, played the latest 40 model, got ideas for making it better, came back the next day with the uh, with the new model, and. In that process, over about three weeks, we're able to find a way of uh, shaving the time off the schedule that allowed them to open in November instead of January, which for a shopping center was of some importance. Um, so then when you go to the workspaces, right, um, if we break it up into zone A and zone B, which we often do, then you have basically two ways in which you can sequence that. If you are able to schedule things at a final level of detail and say work with the eight rooms, then there is many different options, actually 80,000 and some. Um, and that's why obviously we may not want to get into it doing this manually. We would need some device that can manage information, like a computer, right? So if we could actually use the computer, we could actually manage this complexity on our own. I'm not suggesting that we create 80,000 different options. Um, but can do it. So this is what we did, and, and again, you can see the dramatic time savings when you fix your sequence of workspaces versus when you don't fix it and are able to more flexibly interweave the work areas at a smaller scale, uh, take advantage of the availability of workspace when it shows up. So just you know, a very small example, two activities, eight zones, one to three crews gives you over 124,000 possible schedules. Actually, feasible schedules. Um, so the scheduling space is very vast. And what I would suggest and what we've seen in the design space, where we can combine your intuition, your experience, your knowledge, with the power of the computer that can sift through 124,000 options, then you can find truly great solutions. So um, first project where we were able to automate um, some of the generation of, of schedules was in the look ahead scheduling phase for the, the fit out phase or build out phase for the Carnegie Mellon University campus in Doha, Color. There are 12 types of crews, 210 rooms per floor, 20 operations per room, construction operations per room on average. So the superintendent was pulling his hair out every day saying, where do I send my crews? Yes, I need to finish an area in a particular time because the client is coming. I need to finish a full job at a particular time. I need to stay on the budget. I need to be safe, etc. I need to work with who is available. And so he basically had to shoot from the hip and he didn't really have a tool that helped him. So basically he wanted simply a plan that showed where is each crew working each day. And uh, so we created what we, what we call these fragments. Uh, basically, there were 18 different types of rooms with different types of work, 
and so we created a prototypical um, schedule for each room. And then again, with the BIM, we were able to then automatically uh, develop how much room there was, and how long it would take, and how it would be sequenced. And then the computer would simply run through thousands of possible options if a crew is available, if a crew is not available, etc. cetera, um, in terms of finding schedules. And here, we simulated, for example, cost schedule trade-off, cost time trade-off, and we saw that actually um, the shorter schedule was not the most, uh, not the cheapest one, and vice versa, for example. But you also see lots of schedules that are expensive. So if you happen to pick a schedule that is expensive, you're kind of stuck there with the manual method today. We were able also to simulate the heuristics because we had some superintendents that said, we'll finish the soonest if we work in as many places as possible at once. And the other said, we'll finish the soonest if we keep every crew busy. And actually, those guys had a better heuristic. You have a better chance when keeping the crews busy, which would be at the lower end here, the left side of this graph, that your cost is also low. Versus when you worked in many different areas, you can see that there is cheap schedules and expensive schedules um, with the same uh, level of space usage. So with, with the computer simulation, we can test these kinds of heuristics uh, because we'll still be left with heuristics for some time to come. It will be a while till all of this is fully operational. But I think we need to start to work on it. As we're working on, on this, we started to observe sites a bit more, and we were surprised to find, and maybe your projects are different, but we have not yet found a project that's dramatically different. We're in the, uh, typically in the MEP phase, in the, in the uh, finishing phase, we see space utilization of 3 to 4%. Meaning of the available workspace, three or four percent of it is used at any given time. <coughs> we have measured this on a number of projects in Europe and in the US. Uh, it would be great, I think, to collect more data on this because as many projects that we've looked at, it's minuscule in, in terms of the whole industry. But it suggests to us there is an opportunity to build faster, right? If we double space use, we do twice the amount of work basically, we would finish quite a bit faster. And so we, we said, well, maybe we can build a scheduling method in a different way, building it bottom up. Putting a schedule together from each crew and the, what they're working, they're working on this column, how much space do they need for this column, etc. And this was brought, uh, the problem was brought to us from a very small project at Schiphol Airport, where they had to finish the uh, a store in two weeks instead of four weeks. And four weeks wasn't a relaxed schedule, that was already aggressive. The project manager quit, said you guys are crazy, so but the company still had to do it in two weeks because it was going to go airside. And so the choice was, well, it was not really a choice to get everybody through security all the time. So this is the, the store, and so I'll show a very quick video that shows basically these blocks, uh, cartoonish blocks, but each color, each block represents the work of one crew for a particular installation of a particular component. And if you really have to right, figure out what is the fastest you possibly build the work without people conflicting with each other, you have to create this kind of schedule. And so basically, uh, this creates the, the three constraints that I mentioned, the president's constraints, the discrete, the labor constraints, and what's called the disjunctive or unary workspace constraint. And the scheduler maximizes the space utilization, but does not allow spatial clashes. So you can really figure out what's the shortest time in which you can build a project. So this, well, well advance, well, can I advance it? Yeah. So I won't play the whole video. I mean, this is overlaid over the, the floor plan of the, of the site, I understand. This made a lot of sense to the people on the, on the job. I understand for us seeing the first time. Um, it doesn't make that much sense. But I just wanted to show um, this because you know, uh, activity 2 to D, right, happens here at this time, but there's possibly other sequences for some other activity that overlaps it partially, and so there's lots of different sequences you have, especially in the finishing stages. One can, some can be, as we found, dramatically better than others. And so the computer uh, can run through these options, <laughs> analyze them, and when we compare them, um, we did another couple cases, so we looked at three cases. 
And we basically found that the line of balance method, which is kind of the best we had in terms of breaking a job up into work areas, because it breaks it, breaks it up in fairly large work areas, it, um, the durations are longer. When we use the TCM method, they tend to be close to half or 40 percent shorter. So interestingly, if you use the CPM method, you will find durations that are half of that what's actually feasible because the workspace constraints are not considered. So maybe also not surprising that uh, sometimes you have troubles on the jobs because the, not all the workspace constraints are considered. Uh, we can also try what's the effect of adding crews. So if you add on this part, on the first project, if you a second crew might be worth it. After that, it's not worth it. You can see you don't, just don't have the space. Uh, same on the other uh, store project, but on the uh, on the project we did at Stanford, um, the biochemy building, um, it's less clear when you are going to stop adding crews. You can still save duration, so it depends how much is it worth for you to be faster. Yes, it will cost you more money to add crews, and they will not always work, and they will not be maximally effective. But you get a shorter overall schedule. And so these are the kinds of things we can actually now test, again, with the computer model. So this is where we are today. Um, it still takes a while to scale these prototypes to industry use. But what I hope I've been able to show to you is, and what we come away with, is that we have fundamentally three types of constraints in construction. The precedence, the logic of work, our tools work very well resource constraints, if you hardwire them, you are likely cutting yourself off from possible better solutions as things change. Um, so when you can, using the resource leveling methods is better. And then the workspaces, we have really rather imperfect methods of actually handling them, even though that's the most constraining constraint. And there is lots of possible options, so I think we have to find a way of automating some of the generation and analysis of the schedules. Um, and that's what we would love to work with you uh, and advance our industry through that because the better we can allocate our resources, the more money our people can make, the safer they will be, and, and the better value we provide to the clients and society. So just broadly speaking, I'm going to end with a couple broad points. Um, I still need to actually track the first quote down because I re-quoted it from a talk I heard uh, from some guys from Georgia Tech. Um, but uh, there seems to be this guy, Alan Perlis, and it's kind of pre-internet, so it's not so easy to find these things. But apparently, in 1961, he said something like, the automated execution of processes changes everything. And I think that is the opportunity and the danger that you have, we all have, um, in our industry because we haven't automated very much. And I have to believe somebody from the seven plus billion people will figure out how to automate some of the things we do. And then it's not fun to compete with them. 